Welcome to Let's Face the Facts. I'm David Almeida, and I'm your host for this rewatch podcast for the classic sitcom The Facts of Life. I'm an actor in Orlando, Florida, and every week I bring you some of the greatest talent in the Central Florida arts community. Join us as we synopsize, analyze, criticize, and ultimately idolize the show, episode by episode. Hey guys, welcome back to another show. It's another week, and I'm so excited about my guest, my friend Heather Leonardi, who is an amazing actress who now lives in New York City, was able to hop on the Zoom with me and record a show, and I'm really, really happy that we were able to connect, and we hadn't talked in a while, so it was just a good uh, personal reconnection time as well. We mostly work together at Sleuth's Mystery Dinner Theater, which I've talked about many times, but uh, she's been, uh, she was a full-time Disney person and part-time at Universal, just always working because she is so super talented. And you've heard me mention multiple times the amazing production I did of Laughter on the 23rd Floor back in 2013. Well, Heather is yet another person who is from that cast that is on the show. And uh, I'm slowly getting through it. I didn't really plan it that way, but I've only got a couple more people to get on and I will have a, a full house and I don't know, maybe someone will give me a prize. Now, before we start, I gotta welcome a new Tutti Fruity. Welcome to Anonymous. I see what you did there. You took the word anonymous and you changed it to Anonymous, like a mouse. And that's clever like a mouse, too. I'm very happy to have you among the fold. I do not know your name. I know nothing about you. And uh, that's, that's perfectly okay. If you would like to be like Anonymous, whether anonymously or uh, known to me, you can go to patreon.com slash face the facts pod and you can support the show for as little as a dollar a month. So this week, Heather Leonardi and I watched season five, episode six, called The Halloween Show. And the original air date was October 26th, 1983. You heard me half laugh just then because I'm like, ooh. When it comes to a show that happens around Halloween, and they title it The Halloween Show, you know you are in for a creative explosion of amazingness. And if you don't hear the irony in my voice, maybe you can hear the air quotes that I'm making in the air. Anyhow, I'm ready to jump on in. I hope you are too. Let's face the facts with Heather Leonardi. Ladies and gentlemen, all the way from the Big Apple, it is the amazingly talented, lovely, gorgeous, beautiful, and incredible Heather Leonardi! What? Those were the nicest descriptors ever, David Almeida, who I'm just going on record now. The first thing when I saw him on screen, I said to him was, it is a pandemic, sir. How very dare you be looking so good right now? Just for the listeners. You look amazing, sir. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Just don't, you can't see below. I have, I've put on a couple of pounds due to all the COVID baking, the COVID-19 pounds well, yeah, that we we're all, all have, gaining. I think, right? But if it's relative, have any of us? I mean, if it's I, all globally relative to everyone, then are we all mm-hmm. just the same? I don't think that math holds, but that's what I'm telling myself is that it doesn't matter because it's relative to everyone. Well, if everyone in the globe is gaining that much weight, are we putting that much more stress on the planet? Right? The planet's little legs are going to break if we get too heavy. (laughs) (laughs) We're all going to fall through the the surface of the Earth's crust, and and I don't know what's going to happen. The water tables are going to rise. Probably boily, boily death, but that's just a guess. (laughs) But the beauty is, we're all fat. We'll float. Yay! (laughs) Oh my gosh. There's always a bright side. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we are connected via the Zoom once again. That is the beauty of technology is that you can be up there and I can be down here at home. And we have just separately watched The Facts of Life, Season 5, Episode 6, The Halloween Show. It's very scary. It's very scary. Yes. Uh, it has an original air date of October 26th, 1983. It was written by Jerry Mayer. Jerry Mayer is one of the OG writers, producers, creators 
of this show. So he has been with it since the beginning. Which uh, is why a little part of me is like, why is this episode not better? Anyway. (laughs) It feels like it leans pretty heavily on on tropes, but, you know, they they had 30 minutes. And also, literally, what do I know about it? (laughs) (laughs) Well, the beauty is, in spite of the what do I know factor, Heather, part of the process of this podcast is writing, is analyzing the show and giving notes to the writers. Oh. Which someday I will send back in a time machine and you will see all of these episodes fixed and corrected to perfection. Oh, I did not know we had such an objective. This is exciting. Yeah. it's It, it may not happen in our lifetime, but this is a time capsule yeah. that will then be a future past present time capsule and it will fix everything in the universe. Oh my God, sign me up. Well, I guess yes. you already have. Never mind. Thank you. I guess is what <laughs> you're, I'm saying. You're already in it, girl. You are in it. Oh, you're soaking in it. Oh, geez. I should be doing better then. I had no idea. I thought I was on deck. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> and it was also directed by Asad Kalada, who is the man who directed most of the Facts of Life episodes and then went on to bigger fame and fortune as uh, the director of most of the Who's the Bosses. It was actually a bigger thing in his career than the Facts of Life. I, I think it might uh, conjugate into bossai, bossai, Bas- bossi. Bas- who, who's the bossai? Who the bossai? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not the- really great with <laughs> conjugating. You know, I watched Cloud Atlas for the first time the other night. I don't and what, is, what is that? Have you not seen the, the Tom Hanks, Halle Berry movie? I'm, I'm not great at keeping up with, I don't know, things that are cool. Okay, well, it was it's like from 2005 or something. Okay. Like, it's not a new movie at all. Oh, okay. <laughs> and the, the, the movie takes place in different times, like historically in different times. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in the future, there is this sort of different modification of our own language. And it takes a little getting used to hearing them talk because they're beautifully just talking it like it's their own language. Huh. But it's really fascinating. Is it like really a made-up language, like Clockwork Orange, where you have to kind of like decipher it as you go? How does that? Uh, no, it's just like, it's. it sounds like a, like an English derivative. It sounds like a thing. Like instead of saying, I'm telling you the truth, they say, that's the true true. And oh, yeah. Oh, I love they, it. They, that's yeah, the true, when true. they're describing things, your adjectives might be a, a twist on a word that's adjacent to what they mean, but you mm. get it. Mm-hmm. It's it's really fascinating. The, anyway, that's for true, true. Can we please adopt true, true. that the entirety of this recording? <laughs> and maybe then forever in perpetuity? Because <laughs> it's Yes, amazing. that's maybe the movie was meant for you and I to start <gasps> the evolution of this language during the pandemic god i've always wanted to have something important to do this sounds fantastic because <laughs> otherwise we're just actors oh, yeah otherwise <laughs> no i'm not even that right now i got nothing lord <laughs> anyway back to it <laughs> back to it sidebar to it. there will be many of those <laughs> uh it should be pointed out two things about the opening credits number one pamela siegel is back in the opening credits and uh, if you've listened to the last two weeks of uh, this show, you will know that I am not happy about it. Mm. Can you tell I me do... more about that? I, d- I don't know, but I'd love to learn. I do not like this little bitch. Oh, okay. Here's I... the reason. <laughs> it is because this is the point in the show where they're like, oh, we think the girls are getting too old. Two of them have graduated oh, right. from high school. We need to start bringing in other younger right. cast members. Right. So they just kept adding people and none of them really worked out because none of them was as appealing as our own amazing Fab Four. Mm. So she is back in the credits and we see she has a little brief cameo in the episode. And the thing I am happy about most is that her cameo is brief and then we can move on. Okay, good. Hey, I appreciate your strength during these challenging times. Thank you for sharing know, that difficult story. Um, hashtag facts of life strong. <laughs> that's the true true. I know. It is, that's, <laughs> and that, my friends, is the true true. <laughs> well done, sir. Thank you. Yes. For, thank you for that. Call back. <laughs> well, let's get started. And okay. Before we start the episode, Heather, I am going to put you on the spot and ask you two things. Number one. What is your relationship to the facts of life? Did you watch the show? Are you aware of the show? Um, well, David, that's an excellent question. Um, mm-hmm. I am aware of the show. Um, when you reached out a few days ago to ask me to do this, thank you, by the way. I'm very excited. You're welcome. Um, thank you. Yay. Uh, <laughs> I 
went into it and I was like, yeah, I know Facts of Life. It's It's been a while. I mean, it was filming when I was three, four, five. I don't know. I was young. Yeah, you're like a decade younger than I am. So yeah, it was, you were just being born. It was, it was me. But um, I realized uh, when I clicked on the episode, you sent me to watch it, uh, two things, um, perhaps both equally horrifying. Number one, I have, <laughs> I realized I had never seen an episode of the facts of life <laughs> uh, coupled with because in my brain I mixed it up with another show that was running around the same time again a little just before I could absorb a lot of television mm-hmm. um, I I'm embarrassed to say that uh, this podcast has made me realize that my entire life I thought facts of life and um, oh gosh what's the name of it Oh, the one. With, oh no! Oh no! Oh no! What? Family ties. Family ties were the same oh. show. Someone would say "Facts of Life" or "Family Ties," and I would picture "Family Ties." Which, <laughs> um, so Michael J. Fox and yeah, Justine. Bateman. So I was like, "Oh, Facts of Life!" Yeah, and then I did spend about the first six minutes of the episode going, "This isn't the family I remember." <laughs> Where are the hippie parents? Yeah, I guess. Where's Alex P. Keating? I guess something happened. In season yeah. four, that did, changed did everything. Did he die? Did they kill him off, like like Valerie Harper? Or <laughs> right, yeah. So that's the conclusion I came to last night. Was I've never seen an episode until last night, and I thought it was a different show. I had it mixed up with um, a different show. <laughs> <laughs> well, people who have never seen the facts of life are wonderful guests here, and you are absolutely. <laughs> fe- I want you to feel loved and welcome because your completely unfamiliar perspective is always fascinating to me because well, I'm like as I'm a person glad. who was obsessed with it I to hear it's like you've never seen it oh my god it's just so dear like older <laughs> television it either holds up or it doesn't and when it mm-hmm. does it's so wonderful and timeless yeah. and classic and then when it doesn't you're either like yeah it didn't fly or you're like I cannot believe someone used to be able to say that on television like oh uh, yeah maybe we'll talk about it yes and the other thing I like to ask of my guests, Heather, is before we do a, an in-depth dissection of this show, I like to do a general synopsis similar to what you might see in a TV guide, one or two sentences. Would you please provide such a synopsis for our listening audience? Yes, I will do my best. I watched it last night. Um, we open on uh, uh, Edie's Edibles. Edible? Who, who's? Et- <laughs> Edna's. Edna's. Open. Edna's. Edna's. Open on Edie's edibles. Then pan over (laughs) to Edna's edibles, where our story takes place. (laughs) The the shop next door, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. They're in very severe competition. Um, Oh, my God. uh, So I'm killing it so far, right? So it's a Halloween episode, um, Mm -hmm. and it starts off with our our girls, for I don't remember who is who, uh... One of them is telling a, a, a ghost story about how in that very space they were in, someone was murdered and uh, everyone starts to get spooked out. And then that adorable man in a yellow plaid jacket comes in and places an order. It's a little places an order. Mm-hmm. It, it heightens into becoming kind of a hybrid tale of the boy who cries wolf and Sweeney Todd is the best way I could say this episode is of yes is Miss Garrity is that her Mrs. Garrity Mrs. Mrs. Garrett like, wait is she Mrs. Garrett because suddenly there's this this surprise meat floating around and the old man is missing and it's a murder <laughs> house and I, I feel like maybe I don't know I'd like to hear your go in a synopsis since I can't even <laughs> <laughs> this is all the everythings <laughs> and the wrong names are making me happy at the core of my soul. <laughs> that synopsis was was <laughs> perfect in the most perfect, <laughs> imperfect ways. <laughs> oh, and the old guy isn't dead. One of them, Nat, Nat, N- Natalie? Yes! Oh! I'm so proud of myself. Uh, This is literally my greatest accomplishment in weeks. Um, (laughs) Natalie was making it up because she wanted to shoot a film for her class. And the old man comes back and... Yeah. Yes, it's Boy Who Cries Wolf meets Sweeney Todd is the best I can do at this point. 
let's get started with talking about the episode in depth here. We we start off with the store. The store is busy. For a new shop, they, business seems to be going like gangbusters. Good. Good for them. But the store... But the store is arguably too busy, and oh. Mrs. Garrett is freaking out, oh. and Charlotte Ray playing it to the most broadly comedic end that uh, the butchers went on strike during bratwurst season. And, you know, bratwurst season, Heather, in Peekskill, New York, is that's apparently a big deal. Apparently. Apparently. You've never been to Bratfest. No, but bratwurst season? Why is it? It's like, oh, oh, look, the leaves are turning, darling. (laughs) Bratwurst is in the air. Yeah, I think we shall be turning our thoughts to ground up seasoned meats in pig intestines. Although I will say there was a moment where, and I do this when I watch anything, like I'll expect a joke, a certain Mm -hmm. joke, because I'm always playing punchline scramble in my brain. And there was like a missed joke. uh, Who what? Who's the? Who's the random dude that shows up and flirts with the one of them? Who's that guy? Oh, that's Roy. Roy is okay. the delivery boy from the bakery. Okay. Classic. That's Roy, Roy. yes. Uh, I don't remember if it was him, but they said something about brats. And she's like, yep, my brats are the best. Mm-hmm. And it just hung there. And I was like, are we not going to make a worst joke? Yeah. Really? You're just going to let it hang there and not... not- spike it uh, and You're he didn't right. and i was so upset i was like you guys set it up for yourselves and then let it just go yeah you literally I, didn't, just said, I, did, yeah, I didn't even our, think of that either but you're totally are the right. best yeah and not the worst <laughs> right you guys you've set up your own joke and then you just skip well, right by it yeah that's crazy good good catch there i didn't even catch that um but mrs garrett is going crazy mm-hmm. and and she is i don't know what to do <laughs> and, and i do a bad mrs garrett impression what every a fantastic week, mrs garrity <laughs> garrett <laughs> or whoever i said it first <laughs> And if you care to, if you are so inspired at any time to join me with a Mrs. Garrett impression, please let her, let her rip. Well, actually, legit question, because the episode I saw, she was, I I can't tell, was that kind of level energy, is that her neutral or was she playing kind of heightened because we were supposed to be like, oh no, is she chopping people up or is that her like neutral vibe? No, this is her very kind of highly wound up. Okay. We have seen her kind of like this before, but oftentimes she's the one that gives the motherly advice. Mm. And Joe, that didn't sound like you were being yourself at all. She, she's, yeah, it seems a little like she just <clears throat> came off of an acid trip, like a little disconnected <laughs> all the time. Like, I don't know. And um, I mean, spoiler alert for this episode, there is there is a ruse that takes place in this episode and i knew that going in so as i was watching this i thought to myself multiple times she's she's in on it right she's playing this up right that's why i wondered in on the joke right she was so heightened yeah and and the fact is that she's not in on it at all she's the victim of this and i was like wow and there's so many times that I feel like Charlotte Ray is marginalized in her own show and is not left with much to do hmm. or much to play because the girls all have such strong personalities. So, um, yeah, this was a, a weird, there are many weird Mrs. Garrett episodes performance wise. And this is probably one of the weirdest yet. Okay. Well, that's good to know. I, I honestly yeah. wasn't sure. Mm-hmm. But while this is going on, she is being followed around by Natalie with a film camera. And she is, we turn, we, we, we learn that she is making a student film. And basically, Mrs. Garrett is like, would you fuck off? <laughs> and what are you doing? <laughs> that, that was beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, so yeah, Roy is back. Now, we haven't seen Roy in a, in a little while for a few episodes. This is his seventh of eight appearances. Oh on the series and this is the last time we see him for uh over three years it will be three years plus 
before we see him in the season eight Valentine's Day show. Yes, the bakery where, really took off. Got busy. Yeah. Uh, where old uh, boyfriends of the girls come back to haunt them kind of a thing on a Valentine's Day show. <laughs> and well, so he comes back. Horrible. <laughs> Not yeah. scary at all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was it should have been a combo Halloween. Right. Valentine's show. But uh, yeah, so this is uh, this is his seventh and arguably his last appearance as Roy, the bakery delivery boy. Okay. Now, there's also the thing of this this Mrs. Garrett store is a, a gourmet food shop, but she's known for being a baker. Like we know Mrs. Garrett supposedly has the best strudel anyone has ever eaten in the history oh. of food. Okay. So the thing is, I've always just referred to it dismissively as a bakery, but it is in fact, they do have a lot of other things. And I don't. I didn't until this episode happened. I didn't remember, oh, they actually stuff their own sausage. That's yeah. That's a thing that you want to offer your customers fresh made sausage. That's that's the effort you want to go to when you could just be baking shit. Maybe there's confusion around what a bakery a, a, a bakery uh generally provides. M- maybe but as uh, I guess probably good for them that it's, quote unquote, a gourmet food shop. <laughs> so they do have right. wider berth to be able to throw stuff like this in there. Like sausages. So what happens is this old man comes into the store and he's wearing this distinctly plaid jacket. And his name is Mr. Bigley. And he tells the girls that he is uh, amazed at how the shop has transformed. And they're like, what do you mean? He's like, well, it used to be a house. It used to be a landmark. And, you know, there was a big Halloween massacre here. Yep, it was back in Odd Five. The old maid Gruber sisters. One of them killed all the others. But they say she may still be hanging around. And it is talked about that the the murderess's bedroom is now Mrs. Garrett's bedroom. And he says, oh, people talk about uh, there being being really cold when Gertie's around. And the girls are like, Mrs. Garrett's been talking about her bedroom being cold. Isn't that weird? And then the old man orders some bratwurst from Mrs. Garrett and they leave. Then the next scene, the girls are in their bedroom. Heather, we have never seen this bedroom before. This oh. is the first appearance of the Edna's Edibles bedroom. Oh, I didn't know that's exciting. It is. Uh, In the bedroom, the door opens up what looks like the middle of the night. We now learn is early in the morning. Mrs. Garrett walks in in the dark with a knife in this weird, creepy, shadowy (laughs) shot looking like Norman Bates. And then Tootie or one of the girls screams and it's like, what's going on? And then Natalie says... Yeah, Mrs. Garrett's been acting really weird. Last night, she was standing over my bed, sharpening a knife, saying, Helga, you will learn some respect, yeah? And Mrs. Garrett's like, what are you talking about? I wasn't in here last night. Well, where'd you get that knife? Well, it was in the sink next to my toothbrush. And then she was like, whatever, just get up and we need some help in the store. Get out. of it. Let's get moving. We need to start the day. And she says she has so many orders for bratwurst, she's going to have to scrounge up some meat somewhere. And she may have to get creative. (laughs) And then they all get worried because they find Mrs. Garrett's slipper left behind in the room. Proof that she may have been there. So the next scene, we're in the store. And the girls are... Still a little weirded out. Tootie is lighting candles to try to do maybe an exorcism type of a thing. Some kids come in to trick or treat. And uh, it's Pamela Siegel. It's this girl, Kelly, that I don't like, trying to grift some candy off of the other kids. She's dressed like Orphan Annie. And uh, they basically say, get out of here. Nobody wants you on this show. Leave. And uh, she doesn't listen. So then Natalie comes in with a trash bag. And it has... Old Mr. Uh, God, what's his name? Bigley. Mr. Mr. It has old Mr. Bigley's jacket in the trash bag, and she found it in the can out in the back. And Blair's like, wait a minute. He never picked up his order. And then Natalie's like, I called his hotel, and they say that he is nowhere to be found, and his luggage and his plane ticket are still there. What a, whoa, this is really weird. 
And then Mrs. Garrett comes running in, holding bratwursts, and says, I got the meat! I got the meat! 25 pounds of meat miraculously appeared in the ice box. Mm-hmm. She has no idea where it came from, but she just shrugged and went, Oh, well, I'm just going to grind this up and fill my orders. La, la, la. Then Roy comes in, and they're like, Remember that old man that you saw here the other day? Have you seen him? And he says, yes, I've seen him. He was here. I saw him here in the shop when I was making my regular bun run. And I love the term bun run. I do too. (laughs) Yes. So he said, I heard him bickering with Mrs. Garrett. And then they went into the kitchen. And the girls are suddenly like, and this is where we go to commercial. And that's the Sweeney Todd element. Yes. Did but, he uh, come out of the kitchen? Oh, no. Do, do, do. Any thoughts or feelings about anything in the first half of the show that stood out to you? Uh, the first half, I really just spent a lot of time going, where's Alex Keaton? <laughs> um, <laughs> where's Jennifer? Where's Mallory? Yeah, I, I feel like maybe I've made a horrible, horrible mistake. <laughs> um, no, but it was very, I love like the, the holiday episodes. And I do, they... They really did go out of their way to be like, look how spooky we're making it. Yeah. Um, it was very dear. Yeah. Have um, to get creative. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, and and the other thing is that the the um the the this first half ends with Joe being the practical one saying, yeah, guys are making this up. This is crazy. This is all just circumstantial evidence. And then as Joe starts thinking about all the little elements, all the little bits and pieces, even Joe says, wow, the evidence adds up, doesn't it? So it's on that note that all four of the girls are officially spooked by this possibility that apparently they are worried that Mrs. Garrett is possessed by this former resident murderess and she is killing people while in a trance so that she doesn't know that she's killing people. Like you do. It always helps to remove yourself a little bit from the horrors you're doing as you murder people. I, I guess, yeah. For me. Maybe. For me. <laughs> well, we're at the commercial. Before we continue, on the commercial break, Heather, yes. I like to take a little time to get to know my guests oh, and my. Uh, do a little bit of a, a light interview about you and your career. So just a very quick sort of mictour of you and your creative life. Heather Leonardi, yes, sir. where were you born? Uh, I was born uh, in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh-huh, Southern girl. It's true. But I moved to mm-hmm. Florida when I was like three months old. So I basically claim native Floridian, even though I'm not quite. Oh, but and native Floridians are rare enough as it is. Right. And where in Florida did you settle? Uh, in Winter Springs. Oh, okay. That's just outside of Orlando. That is in the Central Florida yes. region. So you are a very much a local gal, indeed. As far as uh, with this now, um, how early were you bitten by the performance bug? And talk to me about where you studied. Uh, great question. Oh, and this will. Uh, and he knows this. I was bitten by the bug when I went to go see uh, a neighbor. My mom was friends uh, with mm-hmm. people uh, a few doors down. Play. I believe rooster in annie at <gasps> the old mark ii i was maybe three oh years God. old and that actor is john freda shut up no he's the reason i be- i was seeing him and i was like i want to do that we would both go on to perform with him at yes. sleuths yes <gasps> right uh, so that's amazing <laughs> And yeah. then uh, did you did you go to school? Did you study after high school? Did you uh, formally study? I did. Study? I was kind of weirdly lazy about applying to colleges. I only applied to two, uh, mm-hmm. New College and Rollins. Uh, I got into both, and I chose Rollins because they had a theater program, and New College did yes. not. Yeah, and Rollins is, is a Ivy League school here in Winter Park. I will say I got a full ride. I'm not like one of those kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not one of those people that would say that, but I did get the full ride. Well, no, but I just, you know, there's very wealthy people at Rollins. And I feel like it's yeah. less douchey to say I got a full ride than to have people think like I'm one of those classic Rollins kids with all that. So, so in many ways, you were like Joe at Eastland because Eastland was a private girl school. And the addition of Joe 
at the time in those seasons was because she was the scholarship student, the oh. streetwise yes. tough gal from the Bronx. Yes. So, absolutely. Yes. So, ladies and gentlemen, the real life Joe Polichek hey. right here on the horn with me. And uh, so you studied at Rollins. They have a very respected theater program. And again, you stayed local. You didn't stray far. And very soon you started establishing yourself quite heftily in the regional theaters and in the theme parks and other performance venues. I did. And it was lovely. It was exactly what I wanted to do. I never wanted to be a famous actor. That actually sounds Mm -hmm. terrible. I always just wanted to be a working actor. Uh, and that is something that I'm very, I will always be very grateful to Orlando for allowing that to happen. Yes. And you are one of those amazing character actresses trapped in the body of a leading lady. <laughs> well, that's the very kind thing to say. Thank you. As in to look at you, you're like, oh, gorgeous cast her in the lead and the, the boring romantic lead. But when I have seen you do characters, you are so funny and you are you, there's no vanity about your sense of humor you you are so comfortable doing weird stuff <laughs> and sleuths is the best breeding ground to let us kind of just find our own spin and our own angle on things and there was this one character in one of the sleuth shows where she was just supposed to be like a spacey california girl <laughs> like not quite there and you eventually the way she developed with you is you basically were on stage like Courtney Love <laughs> on on something. Like, did, didn't you even like draw track marks between your toes and shit? I like did. You were... When I get bored backstage, you'd be like, let's, let's mess with Ginger. <laughs> What's she been shooting today? Yes, yes. The character is Ginger and the show is WKZY. <sighs> and there were times when the guests would get up and say, okay, do you have a question for any of the suspects? They said, yeah, my question's for Courtney Love up there. Like, they totally got that you were yeah. going for just fucking drugged out crack whore. And I don't think and- anyone else made that choice. And I was always like, well, if Sluice is okay with it, I'm having fun. So I know my lines. <laughs> yes. What else do I need to do? I mean, it's I mean, it's not offensive to anybody. It's not like I'm, I represent the crack whore community. Right. And I'm very, very offended in the feelings. I place. think I prefer crack artist, if you don't mind. Yes. <laughs> I, I, uh, creative medication artist I think <laughs> yeah. would be a better. Uh, so, but yes, God, I I miss performing at Sleuths with oh, you because God, God we had so you. much fun. So much fun. So much fun. And things. then you and I. We're so, so lucky that we got to do arguably two of the best productions of our careers. And I will say two of the best productions Mad Cow Theater ever did. I'm just fucking saying it. Both shows I could have run forever. Agreed. We did Neil Simon's Laughter on the 23rd Floor. And we did, oh God, who wrote it? Fuck. Uh, Nell Benjamin. Ah, Nell Benjamin's The Explorers Club. Oh, hashtag Pahat Labong. Which I I only know because I didn't realize this till I moved to New York and I was walking somewhere and I was, you know, walking through theater row and I saw mm-hmm. I packed the Mean Girls marquee and book and lyrics by Nell Benjamin. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, you didn't know that no. she yeah, and I she saw the also... name and I was like, Oh, holy crap. Yeah. And she also did Bat Boy, I think. I did not know this. Good for her. I... I feel like she might be married to Lawrence O'Keefe, who did the music for Bat Boy. And and then he did also the music for, um, oh my God, oh my God, you, uh, for me, uh, Legally, uh, Legally, Blonde. Legally Blonde. So, yeah. Oh, excellent. No, I did yeah, not so, know that, but that's the only reason why I know her name, because I was like, wait a minute, Nell yeah, Benjamin. Because the... Oh, the Explorers Club is great. So those two productions, both of them, they just, there was something really special about them. Yeah. And we, and the casts, we got along so well. And most of us had known each other, but even the new people was just, it was, it was cast well. And Dave Russell directed both of them. And uh, it was so great. And I love that uh, even though you no longer live here and I no longer have the opportunity to perform with you, <laughs> that we have those amazing memories of, oh, the, of those productions. So good. So, so but, good. But people then move on from Orlando. And Heather, please tell me quickly about your life since you have left Central Florida. Oh, God. Well, 
I mean, it started very exciting, and then I'm not going to lie, everything fell apart. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I moved in uh, my niche. Uh, Spin it however you need to. <laughs> um, uh, I leaned into my niche of digital puppeteering, and I got offered a job in San Francisco that wanted to pay me a stupid amount of money, and I just I knew that I, I wanted to do something different, and that would be it. So we left, and, uh, you know, here I am mm-hmm. five years later uh, after leaving Orlando, and I am... Uh, unemployed in New York. So there you go. Everything's great. <laughs> Hi-yo. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, and and then you, the, the company that you worked for out in San Fran actually was using actors by remote. And a lot of the Central Florida people yes. still do that. And, and you hired them, including me. I did it for right. a very brief time. Right. Hired and trained you. You guys well, were amazing. It was lovely, and it was it was an honor to be chosen and to again anything you audition for and get, you're like, oh, that's a win. That's always a, sure. a great win. So, uh, and and I love the chance to get to work with you again. That was awesome. It was lovely. Yes, but now Heather, we have to get back to our quandary of what is going to happen since Mrs. Garrett is clearly cutting people up. And baking them into pies. I'm sorry, into sausages. Who's going for a pie, sir? <laughs> we have said many times, if Charlotte Ray hadn't taken this sitcom and it didn't take off and it wasn't popular, Charlotte Ray very likely would have stepped in for Angela Lansbury. Oh, I can see that for sure. In Sweeney Todd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, that's kind of a, a role I wish I had seen her do at some point. Yeah. So uh, we come back from uh, we come back from the commercial. We are back in the shop and things are a little tense. And Mrs. Garrett comes in now saying some supermarket some from a small town nearby has ordered all the bratwurst I can turn out. <laughs> so she's going to need more meat, pounds and pounds. Or just going to throw this out there hmm. since there is a meat shortage oh. and you just uh, you just had 25 pounds of miracle meat show up that helped you fill the orders you had. Hmm. You can also say no. You can, right. you're like a bakery. It's like, you want a donut? We're out. Come back tomorrow. You, we bake them. You come and get them. We run out. You place an order. I don't have supplies. Can't help you. Go fuck yourself. Desperate times, David. I know. It's like, Yeah. And we have no idea what it's like living in a global <laughs> pandemic, trying to acquire things that we perceive are simple and being like, oh, that's, that's not available? difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so then in come two kids <laughs> dressed. We had trick-or-treaters earlier. Now we have two more trick-or-treaters. Right. And this is now on Halloween. Right. Was the other one that I guess the whole show takes place on Halloween. I don't know. But these two kids come in as Hansel and Gretel. And Mrs. Garrett is just playing with them is like, do you know the story of Hansel and Gretel? I could just eat you up. I'm going to put you in my oven. (laughs) And of course, the girls are horrified. They're like, she's going to fucking kill these children. But I love that the kids were like, yeah, the little children. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and like Hansel and Gretel, remember, they were like, the boy says, something smells really good. Mm-hmm. Can we and go in for like, a sniff and a bite? Yeah. <laughs> Please, sir. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's just so funny how this convenient circumstance happened. And, and Mrs. Garrett even says, you look good enough to eat. Mm-hmm. So then... As soon as she's about to get the kids into the kitchen to give them a snack or whatever they're smelling that's baking, uh, Joe ushers them out. Joe, the one who was the holdout in the first half of the show, is now the one going, get out of here, run, save yourselves. Right. And it's like, wow. So Mrs. Garrett, again, so oddly, so creepily says, Joe, that was unfair. The girl, the, this is Halloween. This is their night. And Joe's like, yeah, I'm sorry. I guess I, I shouldn't have, you know, whatever. And Mrs. Garrett's like, well, it's too late now, <clears throat> isn't it? Like, creepy. Uh... <laughs> Fucking creepy. Oh, yeah. Extraordinary. And repeat, the joke that is going to be revealed at the end of this episode, she is not in on the joke, which makes this behavior all that more, what? So strange. 
So then she's like, okay, we'll close up the shop because we need to start making all these other sausages. And of course, the girls are like, how? Where are you going to get the meat? And she's like, oh, we'll figure it out. Get into the kitchen. And the girls are, of course, like, "Ah, I don't want to go in the kitchen. You go into the kitchen. I'm not going to do it. And then there's just this moment where, and it is in the opening credits, where Mrs. Garrett just screams, now get in there! And the girls all jump around. They grab baguettes and brooms and circle around her and are holding up their respective items to, like, shield themselves from her, like, as protection. So Mrs. Garrett is in the middle of this this uh, sort of... She's the nucleus in this weird atomic <laughs> oddness. And and the last thing... I, I, sh- I got ahead of myself. The last thing that really spooks them is there's, like, where's Mr. Bigley? The whole question of what happened to Mr. Bigley. And Mrs. Garrett's like, well, I don't know. Why are you asking me? And then just as we're getting the things are building to a head and the girls have got Mrs. Garrett at the end of their brooms and breads, who walks in from the house? How he got there? Nobody knows. Doesn't quite matter. But Mr. Bigley. What? And he says, Natalie, I hope I didn't mess things up. I need my jacket. And suddenly they're like, how does he know your name, Natalie? And Mrs. Garrett even says, I'm so glad to see you. You have no idea what I've been accused of. And they're like, what is going on, Natalie? And Natalie's response is, you could look at this as a case of creativity unleashed. Mm -hmm. And uh, Heather, let me stop talking. Let me let you talk a little bit. What has Natalie done? What is going on? Oh, what is the Natalie. explanation? Classic Natalie, am I right? Oh. <laughs> um, that's the true, true. Natalie <laughs> is trying to make a film for her film class at school, and she wanted to make a horror film. So she tried to set this up with Mr. Bigley to try to capture, I guess, an authentic horror film. But he was uh, in on it the whole time. Yeah. And and Roy is hiding in a barrel with a film camera <laughs> because there is, there is a question of, well, if you wanted to film it, Natalie, where is right. the camera? But then the, that answer, that question is answered by Roy, who is in a barrel. So Natalie planned all of this. And you think of it, it's like, oh, she's the one that said Mrs. Garrett was standing over her bed. She's the one that said she found the jacket. And we learned that Mr. Bigley is actually... His name is Lazzaroni. <laughs> He's the caretaker at the town cemetery. But that's not his passion. <laughs> no, but and I, I didn't talk about him before. I should have. He is magnificent. Oh, I love him. He is. I don't think he's doing this intentionally, but he is doing that classic trope of the northeastern old man telling the story that you see in like a Stephen King movie the Mm -hmm. oh whoa it's amazing what they've done with this place here you should have heard about the story of the sisters who all killed each other a lot of history up in that attic there i yep true very main even though we're in new york we're in up you know we're just an hour outside of the city uh barely upstate but the fact is he does it so beautifully he really does and And then he gets this wonderful moment where he says, but my first love was always the theater. And since he's come back for his jacket, he has reclaimed it. And as he throws his jacket debonairly over his shoulder, he says, I'm really a very mellow guy. (laughs) Ciao. And walks off to applaud. I was going to say exits to applause. (laughs) It's like, wow, good for you. (sighs) Yeah, that actor is amazing, by the way. Oh, yeah? Let's, um, yeah, let's wrap up the episode. Then I'm going to talk about the actors very quickly. Is, um, yeah, so the, the episode just peters out. It's such a... Because it's like, Natalie did the whole thing. And then Mrs. Garrett then says, but Natalie wasn't lying. There was a massacre. And there will be a murder in this house tonight. No. As she closes in on Natalie like she might choke her and the others angrily are also closing in and Natalie's like, oh, fuck, they're mad. And Roy is filming it 
Freeze frame and credits. Ah! <laughs> neat, 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 neat. Yoink. Wow. But that Mrs. Garrett was not in on it. So why was Watching, she acting so weird? She is so beyond weird. And you almost wish that she had been possessed, but the ghost was friendly or something like that, <laughs> or trying to clear her name. That's That would be a great movie, wouldn't it? Ooh, I'm the, the clearing your name ghost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the ghost but, of setting things right. Very quickly, the actor who played Mr. Bigley, he's character actor Ian Wolfe, oh. W-O-L-F-E. He, at the time of this uh, TV show, he was 87 years old. Oh, wow. He passed away in 1992 at the age of 95. His first credit is a film in 1934. (laughs) And he has a huge cluster of film appearances in the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s. He was clearly like a contract player. Oh, good for him. Yeah. And then he moved primarily into television, and most of his credits through the middle and later parts of his career are, for the most part, television careers. But he appeared, according to his IMDb page, he has appeared in 14 films that were nominated for the Best Picture Academy Award. Oh, wow. 14 of them, and three of them won, which are Mutiny on the Bounty in 1935, You Can't Take It With You in 1938, and Mrs. Miniver in 1942. So, yeah, so three of them actually won Best Picture. So that's why he's one of those actors where you're like, oh, I've seen him in a million things. Hmm. Like what? I don't know. All of those. Yeah. All of them. It's it's because he's been uh, little tiny roles in high-profile pictures. And uh, so that's of interest. The other thing of interest is, of the kids who play Hansel and Gretel, the boy doesn't really have... Uh, that much going on it looks like that he is uh, the boy's name is sean deverich and he has a few credits but they seem to end in 1990 he is still in los angeles and according to backstage.com he's still an actor an improviser and also does stand up but the interesting party is this girl playing gretel this little girl trick-or-treating her name is stephanie riddell r-i-d-e-l might be Rydell, but uh, she has TV credits that go up to about 2000 into the 2000s, and then her credits shift from performance to songwriting. Oh, she has songwriting credits for Hannah Montana uh, for producing and singing in songs for the animated series Bratz, and she wrote one of the songs on the soundtrack for Burlesque. The Cher and Christina Aguilera movie. It's one of the songs that Christina Aguilera sings. And lastly, she is a member of a pop group called Wild Orchid, Hmm. who existed from 1990 to 2003, which had Stephanie Riddell, as well as Renee Sandstorm, and Fergie. Oh, wow. This this is what Fergie did before Fergie became part of, uh, oh God, Red Hot Chili Peppers? No. No, Black, eyed Black eyed peas? Black eyed peas. And uh, <laughs> one I of knew those it was foods. a food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of those foods. Three words, a food. Yep. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it was, it was delicious. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, so she sang with Fergie and of course, I think wrote some of the songs and all that. They they only went on till about 2003. What an interesting yeah. uh, career to go on to, to see this little girl be like, wow, she would go on to be uh, a songwriter in the biz. Good honor. So overall, what's your, what's your thoughts? What what kind of notes might we send back to the writers in our time machine? How might we fix this episode if you think that's at all possible? Uh, I mean, I guess my biggest question would be why why was Mrs. Garrett acting so weird if she wasn't in on it? I know why. The answer is that's because what the script says and we wanted to make it feel weird and spooky. I know that's the answer. Uh, yeah. I, I wonder if they had a little more time and a little more... Uh, you know, 2020 vision, if yeah. that could be massaged. <laughs> I, I think that's uh, that's probably the biggest problem. And it's that old 1980s sitcom mindset of they don't really worry from week to week about the integrity of whatever is happening. They don't as much concern themselves with consistency of character. And it's not that we haven't seen Mrs. Garrett flustered and uh, and busy, but the fact that they're having her play it like she's spacey and unable to concentrate. Even if they could have attributed it to, 
I'm running a business now. Before, I was just making a menu and cooking for a, a school full of girls. I have so many other things on my mind right now. Uh, but th- they would have had to carry that through right. these in future. Ep- that could have been a great long-term arc. Is Mrs. Yeah. Garrett coming into her own as a as a businesswoman and as a as a shop owner? But certainly, we that's that's far far <laughs> too much to ask or expect of this series. Um, yeah, I think because shows like this need to be reverse engineered that part of the reverse engineering could have made all of the bits and pieces more plausible agreed and uh yeah well we have come to the end of our episode heather oh this was so fun I'm glad you had fun, Em, and I, I hope we're able to do it again. Yeah. And before I send you on your way, the last thing I always like to ask my guest is, off the top of your head, completely random, think of a commercial from your childhood or any time of your life, a commercial that you liked or remember, just quick trip down memory lane. Go. Oh, God, the one that comes to mind, I can't remember what it's for. It was the little boy, <laughs> and it was something of edible, and it, was, it goes, I'm leaving. I'm going. You're never going to see me again. But I made oh. blank. And he goes, blank? What was it? But I oh. made... Uh, Totino's? Is it pizza rolls? Oh, I think it was way before that. But I made Pillsbury... <laughs> I made a Pillsbury salad. I don't know. I, don't know. Uh, I made a donut something, salad something, something for cookies. you. Oh, I made something, something cookies. And he goes, cookies? I think... Oh, maybe? Oh, Okay. Let's look Maybe? this up. I'm looking it up. Crap. Oh, it was such a simple question. I went and made it all complicated. I'm no, sorry. no, this is great. This is fine. Well, we can leave it on that. Okay. That's, that's great. We're going to leave it on a mystery on a, for our Halloween episode. That's how you hook them. You got to hook them in. Exactly. Tune in next <laughs> week and find out. No, I'm not going to do that. If I can find it out, I'll, I'll put it in the bumper for this show after we hang up. That and the McDonald's commercial with the fries where she was like, and I would eat them all myself and not give any to my dumb brother. And she's like, that's playing in her head as she's playing her little recital. And that's like, she's thinking no, about the fries. No, I don't yeah. know this one. And I just remember wow. thinking that the lyrics, and I would eat them all myself and not give any to my dumb brother. When I was like seven, it was the funniest <laughs> my, thing I'd ever heard. My dumb brother. So, Heather, my love, this has been so amazing to get to talk to you again. So much fun, David. Thank you so much for thinking ah. of me. This was just an absolute joy. You are a joy, sir. Oh, you. You are a delight. <laughs> <laughs> so, Heather, come back to Orlando. When everything is crazy, come back down here and do a show, and I'll be in it. And that will make me happy, and that's all that matters, okay? Oh, my God, are you kidding? I would love to. My goodness, I miss my <laughs> Orlando family, and I miss all you all as friends and fellow performers. It's just such a great community. This has been so lovely. Mm. Thank you so much. Yes, Thank you so much. Smooches, my darling, and goodbye. Goodbye, my love. Mwah! <laughs> And there you have it. That was Heather Leonardi. Oh, it was so great to talk to her again. I love her so much. And uh, when I make that sound, that kind of a voice, it reminds me. You have not lived until you have watched The Puppy Bowl with Heather. Because Heather is one of those people where when she sees puppies, she makes noises. So it is just a complete... You can watch Heather watching the Puppy Bowl and not even be able to see the TV, and you get the full entertainment package of her just going, ah, ah, oh, and making all these cute sounds because she is just so insanely responsive to little teeny tiny furry cute things. <laughs> so a little bit of a corrections corner. We were talking about playwright Nell Benjamin and uh, talking about the things she had worked on, and I did get a few things mixed up here. So, yes, she is married to Lawrence O'Keefe. Lawrence O'Keefe did write the music and lyrics for Bat Boy, the musical, and there were two other guys who wrote the book to that. He did do the music for Legally Blonde. She did the lyrics. And then Heather's The Musical is another thing that he did, but without her, was co-written with uh, a guy named Kevin Murphy, but not the same Kevin Murphy from Mystery Science Theater 3000 and Riff Tracks. So, uh, yeah, if you want a cluster of 
teen girl-centric musicals. You've got Mean Girls, you've got Legally Blonde, and you've got Heathers, and uh, I do not apologize that I cannot keep them straight in my stupid brain. Anyhow, the other thing we have to discuss is this door situation. I talk about it in the extras, I cut it out of the episode because I talk about it at length, and I was not very good at expressing it clearly. I encourage you to go to the webpage for the episode and see what I'm talking about. But here's the deal. Remember Matthew talked about what is the deal with the fact that we can read Edna's edibles in the window in the opening theme slide with the title of the show? Well, I figured out what that is, is that's the door. And when you open the door all the way so that it almost slams up against the building and that picture window, you are able to see Edna's edibles from the front view and therefore not mirror view. So I've got pictures as visual aids. I still feel like I am incapable of verbally explaining it with any uh, deftness. So uh, have a look. Visual is always better, at least for me it is. Other little bits and pieces and points I didn't get to make in the show are that the two kids at the beginning who come in with Pamela Siegel, the boy is dressed as a clown, the girl is dressed as an angel, they are not credited. They, they have nothing. We do not know who those children are. Uh, if anyone knows who they are, please let me know. I'd be curious to find out. Were they just kids of the producers or something? And the other thing I noticed in the end credits was uh, Lauren Lester as Roy. Even though this is his last appearance for a while and, and is technically overall his penultimate appearance, he gets the and Lauren Lester as Roy credit which is interesting. That typically means somebody did a little bit extra bargaining when they were uh, cutting his deal for his appearance on the show, like his manager or his accountant or something like that. I don't know, maybe they were even considering bringing him back on a more consistent, regular basis. I do not know. That would be interesting to find out. And the last thing is the commercial Heather talked about where we were not sure what the, the I'm leaving, you're never going to see me again commercial. Uh, it was Pillsbury cookies. Heather was right. She doubted herself and she shouldn't have. And uh, you can sleep okay tonight and not worry about what was that commercial. Was it really for the Pillsbury cookies? It was. Anyway, that ends this week's show. Next week, I'm going to be watching Season 5, Episode 7, called Advance Placement. So you can watch the episode for free on the Roku channel or at dailymotion.com. Check out the links in the show notes or on the show's webpage, and they will get you where you need to go. That's all for this week. On behalf of me, Mrs. Garrity, and all of the girls and staff at Edie's Edibles, we hope you're doing okay, staying safe, staying sane, and remember, the facts of life are all about you. Let's Face the Facts was produced, written, hosted, and edited by me, David Almeida. My theme song was beautifully arranged and recorded by Ned Wilkinson. Our website is facethefactspod.com. You have to drop the let's. And that's where you can find extra pictures, video, and audio extras from the digital cutting room floor. Follow the show on social media. We're everywhere under the handle Face the Facts Pod. You can become a patron of the show by going to patreon.com slash face the facts pod. And don't forget, go to your favorite podcatchers and subscribe, rate, and review. Tune in again next week for another thrilling episode of Let's Face the Facts.